Hello YouTube! In this video, I'm going to be discussing lifting wisdom coming from the Muslim world. I've already made two videos in the same vein about the Greek mythology and the power of archetypes, and also all of the wisdom we could get from Bushido and the spirit of the samurai. And I want to continue these videos because the more I research and the more I look up traditions, ancient traditions, the more I realize that we, lifters, can truly learn from all aspects of life. So today, I want to start looking at a religion. And it's something that I didn't think would relate so strongly to the practice of bodybuilding or powerlifting in general. And I was incredibly surprised because the carryover is very impressive. So I want to share with you the wisdom and the, the pearls of knowledge that I managed to find in the Islamic tradition, especially in the Quran. I want to make clear, of course, that I will, that I will not be discussing Islam as a religion and that I'm going to be focusing mainly on what lifters can gain from it. So even if you are not Muslim, you will be able to beneficiate. I made sure to put out the video on a Friday because it's a special day for Muslims, but anyone who is Christian or atheist can still benefit. And if you're Muslim, I hope I'm going to be able to show to you certain aspects of your religion so that you can love them even more because they truly are almost crafted to turn you into a good representation of what a man is supposed to be and also what a good lifter should espouse in terms of value and everyday life. If you're the type of person who has an adverse reaction to Islam for a reason or another, that is your prerogative, but I truly encourage you to actually watch this video because it might reconcile you with something that you don't know very much of. I'm not an expert and I'm not going to pre pretend to be an expert, so I'm going to stay away from the theological and the political aspects of Islam and I'm not going to be mentioning Allah or the Prophet too much but I will still, of course, use the name of Allah because when you cite the Quran, you have to cite Allah. If you do not believe in the Islamic God, you can just think of it as nature, God, or whatever. It truly really doesn't matter. I'm not really focused on the source. Rather, what I care about is the message. And you will see that even if you are a non-believer, the message is still great and it's still applicable. So listen up because today, we are going to see what we can learn from Islam in terms of personal development. Now, Islam is a religion of discipline and sacrifices. That is true for any and every religion in reality, but Islam puts a, a very strong accent on this. And you see it with the practice of praying five times a day, for example, or Ramadan that encourages fasting all throughout the day, and even the renouncement of water, which is a strenuous task and a very difficult challenge. All of this participates in the overall applications of Islam, because if you were to rank religions in terms of difficulties, the amount of restriction on your personal freedom imposed by Islam is great. But it's for one goal and one goal only, to toughen you up, but also to open up new possibilities. You, you allow renouncement in your life, because there's going to be a payback. And I think that all lifters can relate to that. We renounce certain aspects of our lives. We renounce the ability to go out and drink every time we want. We renounce the ability to eat junk food. We renounce the comfort of staying home when it's cold and we go to the gym instead. All of these are sacrifices made because we know that down the line, it's going to lead to something greater. And that is a key aspect of developing yourself as a male which is the rejection of instant gratification, something again that Islam insists on. And this is when we get into the practicability of Islam, because too many times people who are not religious look at religion and think that it's just an endless list of tenets that have no real application. And that's not true. Most of the time, the application needs to be discovered. For example, in Islam, intoxicants are strictly forbidden. But that's for a very interesting reason. It's not just because God decided that, it's because they tend to lead to laxity. 
and the, uh, that's what we say in French. In English, we say laxity, which is la, uh, the, the tendency of giving up on oneself, the tendency of becoming too self-indulgent. All of these come from the in intoxicants. So this is why they are banned. And every and any sentiment or feeling that leads to the same type of mindset is also proscribed in Islam. So this really strong focus on discipline and the ability to sacrifice for the future is what we can learn from. And I have selected a few quotes either from a hadith or from the Quran directly, surah, so that we can learn together. The first one is, the most beloved actions to Allah are those performed consistently, even if they are few. Now, for a Muslim, that would mean worshipping Allah five times a day. But for us, lifters, it, it carries a different message, but one that is similar in its, its sentiment, and that is that nature in general and the ability to have a successful life relies entirely on consistency, even if you are not super voluminous in the amount of actions you take. For a lifter, it's going to mean that it's much better to train consistently for a few years rather than go super hard a few times a day for two weeks and then give up. And that consistency is always rewarded. It's a truth across the board that you will find out the more you develop yourself. The second quote that I like is, Verily, never will Allah change the condition of a people until they change it themselves. Again, ap applied to discipline, this makes a ton of sense. You cannot expect the world to change you. You cannot expect something magical to happen. You have to wish it and you have to then will it. And then the third step is to actually get it done. And to get it done, you have to develop discipline. Discipline is the ability to restrain your, uh, your drive, to restrain your portions, because you know that it's going to morph you into something greater. That amount of discipline, that amount of, in a sense, chains that you're going to put around your own neck is needed and too many people don't understand that. Islam truly shows that greatly that freedom is not found in the complete absence of restriction. Rather, it is a select amount of restrictions that you're going to apply to yourself willingly because you understand they're going to make you better. When you start lifting, it's exactly what you do. You change your life, you start lifting, you start becoming serious about physical development because you know that it's for the better. If you only looked at the downsides and thought, okay, now I can't eat junk food, it's painful, I have to do this one hour every day, all of these would point out to the, to the, the action of lifting being bad. Just like a Muslim could say, wow, I have to, to pray five times a day, it's a waste of time, I have to fast during Ramadan, I have to engage in certain practices that humble my spirit. All of that on paper sounds like it's not good for me. But if you actually look at the consequences, it is. And the acceptance and the, the, the seeking of the consequence is what matters. This is where the rejection of instant gratification makes a ton of sense. And it's something that I particularly love with Islam because it's a strong message that is carried throughout the preachers when you listen to muftis, when you listen to imams. They repeat it all the time. If you accept instant gratification, the thing that you will not be able to accept afterwards is the consequences, because you will have to pay for them. You will not be in control of them. On the flip side, if you reject instant gratification, now the thing that you're going to look forward to is the consequence, because you have rejected instantaneous pleasure and you're going to be rewarded for it. The entire logistic of heaven, of any religion, is based on that principle. So even if you do not believe in religion, that mechanism is still worth it, meaning that the pushing of instant pleasure for a greater reward, in this case, even if it's not heaven for you, is still going to be great. But the only way to do that is through discipline. The third quote, again, from the Quran, Fighting is ordained upon you, and it is disliked by you. It may well be that you dislike a thing even though it is good for you, and it may well be that you like a thing even though it is bad. In the same vein, in continuation with what I just explained to you, yes, instantaneous pleasure 
is something we're going to naturally seek because it feels good. But does it mean that it's good for us? Clearly not. So if we just believed that whatever our body tells us feels great is great, we would be led astray. This is where God comes into play and in following the teachings of God, or in this case, the teachings of discipline. Discipline is what is going to interject itself between you and pleasure so that you can remember, okay, if I reject this, I will get a reward down the line. And that is absolutely true. Does it mean that the action of rejection will feel good? No, not at all. But the reward will feel good. And as long as you do not have the ability to actually intellectualize that concept, it's going to be very difficult for you to actually embrace discipline, embrace the sacrifice, because the actual reward might not make a ton of sense to someone who always seeks pleasure as, again, the only worthy thing to pursue. So, even though it is, in a sense, mortification, the, the rejection of pleasure within Islam is applicable to every single male because it's a mortification that is going to pay. It pays dividends at some point. And that is, again, how you build discipline. It's this acceptation. You have to accept it. And it's, of course, much easier if you have the faith in Allah because you know that Allah will reward you. Well, even if you don't believe in God, I can tell you that nature, that the wood, always rewards people who are able to engage in such sacrifices. Now, of course, that invokes a lot of pain, and the Quran and Islam treats, uh, uh, treats with pain, talks about pain a lot. But it's always presented as a gift, and that is also truly beautiful. The acceptation of something that is not pleasure, that is the exact opposite of pleasure, as not negative, changes a man, because it completely modifies the interaction and the relationship you have with the sentiment and the sensation of pain itself. If you always feel as if it were a punishment and you perceive it, you're going to hate pain. You're going to run away from pain. But if you think it's a gift, it's going to allow you then to receive the reward that pain will actually be able to grant you if you were to accept it. And again, I have three quotes from you. The first, so indeed, with hardship comes ease. What does that mean? Well, it means the wood, because in reality, it might sound like it's completely illogical. Why would hardship bring you ease? A hardship is something we all try to avoid at all cost. Well, I can tell you one thing. The type of people that try to avoid hardship are the most miserable. All of the people that are devoured by anxiety, by, by depression, they tend to be people who took themselves away from the stream of life. They do not want to compete. They don't want to actually contend anymore. And therefore, their life has no meaning and it devours them from the inside. It makes them perfectly sorrowful. Islam teaches you that you have to accept the hardship. It's even said multiple times that God bestows hardships upon you, not because he hates you, but because he loves you dearly. He wants to challenge you because he understands that your growth can only be found in the challenges. And that type of mindset also is going to keep you away from the spirit of entitlement. Because if you think that you're too good for hardship, you are going to regress as a male. You need to constantly accept the challenges that life throws your way because it's a perfect dish out of pain that allows you to push your threshold and gain more discipline. You amass that very important value. Also remember, and that's also from the Quran, that Allah does not burden a soul beyond that it can bear. This means that you can overcome anything. And the logic in this is similar. For Muslims, it means that Allah loves you. He will never impose a challenge on you that you, have, you do not have the ability to beat, ever. And in truth, in everyday life, you will see the same thing. The challenges that are going to knock on the door are going to be very overwhelming, but you will never face one that is impossible. It is not something that happens. Every challenge is doable. You can always overcome it if you apply yourself. And that, again, is the acceptation of pain. If you let pain victimize you, well, you're going to be a victim. If you see pain as an adversary, 
Now there is a fight, now there is a confrontation, and that confrontation can only result in your victory because pain is not real. Pain is a sensation within you, just like fear. So, because it's invoked within your body, you are the only one who has the ability to actually defeat it. And when you do, you're going to be rewarded because is there any reward for good other than good? A very important question again present in the Quran. And the answer is no, because discipline is its own reward. Once you come to understand this as a lifter and as a man, your life is going to be transformed. You're going to stop looking for things that don't matter, for petty rewards, just like, again, pleasure. Pleasure is, in truth, a petty reward. It's a very bestial, base level instinct of always seeking that release of dopamine or, of, or endorphin or whatever, but it doesn't really matter. It's just material. There are things in the spiritual world that are, that are worth much more, and discipline is one of them because it allows you to overcome those basic instincts and on top of that, it opens the door for greater things. For a Muslim, it's going to be his relationship with God. A Muslim that is always driven by pleasure is not one that is in connection with Allah. His, his relationship with Allah is poor, it's very shallow. And it's the same for us, even for us lifters. Your connection with your body, with your spirit, if pleasure is always managing to wedge itself between you and who you want to be, well, you'll never actually accomplish anything. That discipline is what is going to remove the pleasure and allow you to actually access what you always wanted. So, that discipline that you build through the pain is its own power. It's a power that then allows you to access whatever you want in life. It's important to develop. And as you develop it, you're going to become more combative. Now, I've always found that Muslims are very combative and it's something that they sometimes get criticized for, but I think that it's one of the best aspects of the religion. The fact that they are aggressive in their belief, they do not back down. It's something that you need to develop as a male. You need to have strong convictions and you need to be able to tell yourself that no matter what happens, you're not going to back down, you're going to stay true to your principles. If there is one thing you can learn from very religious men, it's that talk to a Muslim or a Christian or whatever, someone who truly believes in God and who believes that they are worshipping God and they are doing the things the right way, and you will find that within their heart, there is no shame. Shame is a killer. Shame is what's going to slow you down. So remove that. And a good way to remove it is, again, to build yourself up through the discipline and the pain that comes with it. Because it's what allows you to strive to become better and face adversity. It's what I told you in the introduction. Uh, Islam, in truth, is a religion of personal development. All of the aspects of the Quran, for example, or the Hadith, really focus on your ability to become a better person. And it's presented, of course, for Muslims as developing your ability to please God. But whether it pleases God or not, does it really matter? I mean, of course, if you're a believer, you're going to tell me that, yes, it's the only thing that matters. But I mean, in the grand scheme of things, isn't it also that your God is trying to find a way to get you to better yourself by, in a sense, putting his own, um, not necessarily admiration, because I don't think a God would admire you, but appreciation in the balance? Isn't it a way to develop men through worship, right? It's really what I believe when I think about it, because it's not just that you're worshiping a God. Through the worship, you worship also not necessarily yourself, but rather your potential, and you develop it. You, bec you become a better man to please Allah, but in doing so, you still become a better man. So, it's, it's a double whammy in a sense, it's a double bonus. And for people who don't believe in Allah, well, you can just remove it from the equation and it makes absolutely no difference. So, this ability to face adversity and be combative is also very important for us. And I also have three quotes. The first is actually a hadith. The reality of manners is that it results from beautiful character. Thus, manners are the manifestations of the integrity and strength in one's inward personality into action. So first off, the focus of action, of actually doing things, is very important. Islam doesn't just stay 
within the realm of spirituality and, and, and wishful thinking. It wants you to apply it. It's not enough to be pure of thought. You need to be pure of action and you need to actually get things done. And it is going to shine through your character, who you are as a man, as a lifter as well. I can tell you that I have always noticed that the best lifters with the best natural physics also have developed characters. They're not perfect, they're not necessarily even nice, but they have a very deep personality. There's a lot to them. They're not easily disco discoverable because they have searched who they were and they came up with an answer. And that answer is complex, just like we all are. But I truly also think that if you want to get to that point, you're going to have to allow the challenges of life to hit you again, again, and again. In a sense, you're like a mountain that is being crystallized by the, sea, the salt within the sea. You're taking into a more complex shape. You're becoming more dense. And that is the manifestation, of course, of your inner strength. Allah also wants you to do what is beautiful. Allah loves those who do what is beautiful. A very important point, because it, it is a throwback to the Greek ideal. Every single time you look at religions or systems of belief that shape great men, masculine men, you always find that they, they put the accent and the emphasis on doing what is beautiful, what we call in French, le beau. And le beau can be subjective, but you always find out that the standards of beauty across religions and cultures tend to be similar. And these standards also apply to lifters. When you lift, when you bodybuild, what are you bodybuilding into? A beautiful statue, something that is going to be gorgeous. And that is the aim for perfection that we're all striving for, but can never truly achieve. In Islam, it is going to be because God is perfection and no human can hope to measure up to God. For us, it's the acceptation that perfection is simply an impossibility, which doesn't stop us from trying to run after it and trying to achieve it as much as possible. And in a world, in a modern world, that is constantly trying to revamp the definition of what beautiful is, and which shows us abominations of nature and tells us that this is the new beautiful, well, it is the best time to call back upon more tradition and more sensible times and recall to ourselves what true beauty is. And true beauty is to be found in discipline, in pain and self-sacrifice. Anything that can be created out of pleasure, gluttony, the complete abandonment of the soul, the indulgence into sins, all of that cannot result in anything beautiful. It is simply impossible. And thinking it is possible is, in a sense, Luciferian in nature. It's an inversion of values that you need to push away because if you fall for it, you're going to live a miserable life. And that is when the pride, that is when the consistency and the combativity comes into play. You need to be able to look at these things, at these degenerate traits and say, no, this is not the way to live my life. I will never accept it. Not for me, not for the people that I love. And talking about people you love, one of the men that actually brought me forth and actually introduced me to more Islamic faith and more Islamic wisdom is a man by the name of Mufti Menk. And Mufti Menk actually has a quote that resonates with me and also is going to teach you more about that combativity and the ability to earn something truly beautiful. He said, when it comes to gains, you can either legitimately earn, which is prolonged, or you can illegitimately achieve, which might be faster, but can never be kept. That is the ethicality aspect of Islam that I also particularly appreciate. The fact that there is a code of conduct. You cannot just do things randomly. There are certain ways to do things to be a proper man, to be a proper Muslim, a proper believer. In this case, it applies to us lifters as well. If we only were to look at the results, well, we would all take steroids because if we just want to get muscular, that's the fastest way, right? But it's not ethical, and it's not ethical because in terms of practicability, of, of pragmatism, we know that it's not going to result in anything sustainable. So it's in a sense a shortcut. A, a Muslim would say it's a pact with Dajjal, it's a pact with a jinn, right? Taking steroids, in a sense, is like 
engaging in shirk with a gin where you accept to take a product that is going to give you results, but all blessings come from Allah in Islam. So if you take something that is not correlated with what Allah would bestow upon you, then you are turning your back on it. It's also the reason why I think that Islam is a great religion for lifters because there is an actual built-in clause, an anti-steroid clause within Islam. One, because it's anti-intoxicants. Two, because it's against anything that can, that can be earned illegitimately without the actual support or help of Allah. So it's something we can also learn from as lifters. Always try to earn things that you can then actually keep. And you know exactly how you are to gain them because anything you can gain naturally, you can maintain naturally. And you can always bet on the fact that shortcuts and the ability to cheat is always going to result in damages down the line. Islam has a particularly strong stance against black magic and the invocation of demons because they understand that the price that you pay for the benefits, the money, the power you would get from these invocations is your soul, it's your relationship with Allah and that is the most valuable thing that you have in life. For us, it's our ability to trust our bodies. It's our ability to actually develop something and build something by ourselves. Now, these are the three uh, values that I wanted to share with you first. So the discipline, the pain, but also the ability to face adversity and be combative. But if we were to combine these three, it's, it would lead us to a fourth value, which in my opinion encapsulates all of that and is an important step that any believer or any lifter will get to, to their great benefit, because once you have it, you have opened up a new stage. But before I get to that, let me check the time. Excellent. So, maybe you have already guessed it, but this fourth value that is incredibly important in Islam and incredibly important for us lifters is confidence. The ability to trust oneself, the ability to be certain that what you're doing is correct. And in Islam, it is particularly important to develop that trust, not only in yourself, but also in Allah. Because if you are to submit to Allah, well, you have to accept that he loves you and he's looking for your best interest. That way you can focus on what you control in life. You will see that even if you do not submit to God, it is still applicable because this overcoming of hardship births confidence. The more challenges you manage to actually surmount, the more you're teaching yourself that whatever happens, you can do it. Nothing is going to stop you. That is true with lifting too. It's why I always say that once you get your first taste of gains, you are on the right path because you're teaching yourself repeatedly that you can get it done. You could get your arms from 13 to 14 inches. Why not to 15? You, get, you got your squat from 200 to 300 pounds. Why not 400 pounds? Well, there is no reason why you couldn't do it. You did it in the past. You can do it again. That is called confidence. But again, see what I just did here. Confidence is built upon past achievements. So it's important, again, to go through these hardships. And in Islam in particular, there are two uh, specific characteristics that I hope I'm not going to, uh, to denature too much. But the first one, and they are both related to confidence, of course, that is very important to develop is Iman, your Iman. And Iman is the inner belief and inner faith, especially in the metaphysical aspects of Islam. So it's pretty much believing in the religion in itself, in its beauty and the fact that it is the true calling of humanity. For us, for lifters, if we were to try to transpose that to us, to our systems of belief, it would be the trust in the fact that your body has the ability to grow and you have the ability to develop yourself. And it's important to build that to become confident because that faith allows for a solid foundation so that you can build your life on it. I can tell you for a fact that lifters that enter this game thinking that they have infinite potential, thinking that there is no limitations, they go far. But the people that enter with no faith, with no hope, they go nowhere. Because how exactly are you supposed to build something on shaky foundations? It's not going to happen. Likewise, a Muslim that distrusts God, that doesn't believe in God fully, that sometimes thinks that God is not looking after him, 
God doesn't have the best intentions, that Muslim will never be able to develop his relationship with Allah. He's never going to be able to grow in the faith because he didn't start with faith in the first place. You need to have that inner confidence that things are going to be okay and that you're going to be able to carry on and build something strong. That is the Iman. Now, I want you to know that in Islam and in lifting in general, this belief, this faith is not based on just blind trust. It is actually based on reason. And there is a very important hadith that I want to cite to you that goes, Verily, the vilest of all creatures in the sight of God are those deaf, those dumb ones who do not use their reason. So I'm not telling you to just believe me outright. I'm telling you to believe your body, just like Islam and Allah does not tell you to trust him blindly. He's saying, listen to your reason. Look at the wood. You will find my presence in everything. You will find that everything I say to you is true. It's the same for lifting. Just lift for two months. You're going to make gains. You're going to grow. That is the proof in and of itself that you have the ability to develop faith without actually having to need faith in the first place. Faith will come through action, just like for a Muslim, your faith will grow through your prayers, by doing your, doing your salat, doing your dua, etc., etc. And that confidence that you build, in my opinion, results to more wisdom. And that wisdom then leads to the second iteration of confidence that is important in Islam, and that is called the tawakal. So I don't know if I pronounce that properly, tawakal which is action. So if the Iman is the innate belief and the, in a sense, metaphysical belief that, that the faith of Islam is correct and allies the God of the word, then Tawakal is the action you're going to be taking so that you can reinforce that confidence. And if you look at the steps, again, it's just pure personal development. The first one is to make an effort to achieve your goal. So for a lifter, God or no God, that makes a ton of sense, right? To build up your confidence, you need to make an effort to achieve your goal. Then there is thinking good thoughts and dispelling doubts from the mind. Again, believe in your potential, stop thinking that you have bad genetics, and just keep going forward, keep aiming for more. That is the mindset that results in the best physiques. And the last one, the one that I like the most, is being at peace with Allah's will, being pleased with one's own destiny. That is incredibly important. Too many people complain about the cards they've been given. They complain about not having enough in life without realizing that they have plenty. And the fact that they only already have so much should be enough. It should be enough for you that you have two legs and two arms and enough food to grow. That should be enough. You have absolutely no excuse not to grow. You have absolutely no excuse not to try your best, but if you always refuse to achieve that, if you refuse to develop that ability, that confidence will never actually grow within you and you'll never get anything done. Because gratitude, the last aspect I want to discuss with you in this discussion around Islamic wisdom, is truly also important, maybe even more important than confidence, because you will see that this truly is going for circle. When you finally achieve gratitude and you breed gratitude in your everyday life, what happens is that the circle of comprehensive wisdom, in this case, Islamic wisdom, is finally completed. You built discipline through the acceptation of pain. You made yourself more combative as a result and confident and then you become thankful for it. All that you went through, all of the difficulties, now they are revealed in their beauty, they are revealed for what they were in the first place, a gift. And that gift, by its acceptation and the, the, the gratitude you're going to have through it, is going to allow the cycle to continue. Because if you go through one cycle of this and you achieve gratitude, the next time pain comes knocking on the door, you're going to understand, okay, this is my chance to develop more discipline that then is going to make me more confident and I'm going to be even more grateful. This, I believe, is the, the be, not benevolent, but it's the virtuous 
circle that all Muslims aim, aim to enter. Because once you're in that circle, well, this acceptation of your faith and being at peace with Allah's will is incredibly easy because your life is great. It's tough to not be at peace, not be appeased and pleased by a good life. And that is, in my opinion, the trick of worship. You worship something, God, Allah, because he is there to give you a better life. And you follow the principles that are there to please him. But in truth, these principles is what gives you a better life. Now, if you're a Muslim, you can tell me that it's all from Allah and that's perfectly fine. But I'm saying that for lifters, you will do the same thing. You'll get a good life and you will be able to realize that at the end of the day, it was all through your action. Your action was what's going to determine it. So I truly encourage you to actually breathe gratitude, be actually thankful in everyday life. And to help you again, I have three quotes. The first one is, anyone who is grateful does so to the profit of his own soul. And that's true. I, I find too many people who believe that gratitude is something that you do for others. Like thanking someone is for that person in particular. It's not a proper philosophical understanding of gratitude. Gratitude in truth is only for your sake. When you thank someone, yeah, sure, it makes them feel better, but you're becoming a better person because you are showing gratitude to another human being. And in Islam, it's the exact same thing. By applying this gratefulness all throughout the day, all throughout the years, you grow your own soul and you slowly but surely fall in love with God because God is making your life better and you thank God in return, which also makes your life better. So it's an endless development of it. And it's the same for lifters. By loving the hardship, you come to again see it for what it is, a gift, and it's not hardship anymore. So your life again increases like this just through a switch of perspective. So develop your gratefulness as much as possible. Understand what it truly does. What it does is, it transforms something that used to be painful, that used to be maybe something you would try to avoid, into something you will actively seek because you will actually be able to perceive its benefits. From a hadith, I can also cite, do people think they will be left alone after saying, we believe, without being put to the test? And that is the acceptation of the cyclical nature of hardship. Too many people, and that's incredibly prevalent with lifters, Live for six months, then they stop and they think, oh, I have to do this forever? And the answer is yes. Because the cycle I just described, the cycle of discipline, of pain, of commitment, of, of confidence, of gratitude, is, is never ending. And you know what happens if you end it? You lose it all. All of the benefits go out the window. If you stop accepting pain, your confidence and your discipline will completely vanish. And you're going to lose the ability to be grateful. I can tell you that, I think that for believers and for men in general, the trait that makes the difference between wise men and fools is gratitude, is the ability to take what life throws at us and make the best of it with a smile on our faces. That is true faith in one's own ability because you know that nothing is going to bring you down. Now, that test is the acceptation and it's what differentiates winners and losers. Losers cringe and they whinge when pain comes knocking, when hardship comes knocking. And it's also what would happen with a Muslim, right? A bad Muslim would complain and say, Allah, why did you send that hardship to me? A good Muslim would accept it with humbleness, bow his head and say, I don't quite understand why you're doing this to me, but I know that it's for the best. I accept that this is going to make me better and that my reward will come. Well, your reward will surely come because the entire thing is set up so that you can become a man that will turn hardships into reward. And I'm going to leave you with the last quote, my favorite quote, and one that I believe needs to permeate your every thought because it truly encapsulates everything I just said. The more you read the Quran, the more you'll fall in love with the author. For Muslims, I don't even need to explain. I'm sure you already read that quote, but for us, for lifters, for people who don't believe, what does it mean? Well, it's very simple. The more you practice what I just told you, the more you engage in that cycle, the more you're going to fall in love with this word, with nature, and by default, with yourself. 
Because the more you're going to feel at home, the more you're going to realize that you were placed there for a reason and that your actions are the reason why you feel so good, are the reason why you are so empowered. This is a key aspect of the life of people who actually make a difference, of people who actually develop great physiques, of people who actually are very happy in their life and joyful. They are the ones who understand that this is a game to be played. Anyone who turns their back on the game is going to lose by default. So I say, if you haven't already, to try to embrace all of these principles. And if it helps you to actually embrace them through Islam, if you're already a Muslim, or if you're someone who's just spiritual and interested, I bid you actually research the faith more because you will find that even for people who do not believe in Islam, there is great value to be applied. And I hope that today's wisdom was of great use, and I will come back with more of these applicable principles in later installments. Thank you for watching. Have a good night.